It's great to be at the Donegal Youth Convention and to see, well, I can't actually see you in the dark, but anyway, I'll believe by faith that you're there. Uh, what do an exam paper, C.S. Lewis, and a 10-year-old boy all have in common? They're not directly connected to each other, but one summer, a teacher who needed a bit of money was marking over 200 exam papers, and it was boring and tedious work. And in the middle of one of the exam papers, there was a blank page. He said, I nearly gave the guy an extra five marks for leaving me something I didn't need to read. And on that blank page, he wrote, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. And so was born one of the greatest stories ever told, The Hobbit, which leads into The Lord of the Rings, uh, which led into some fantastic films. And what's, well, that's the blank page. What's C.S. Lewis got to do with it? C.S. Lewis was a great friend of J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Hobbit. And Tolkien got a bit discouraged at times and didn't want to keep writing this book. And Lewis encouraged him to keep writing the book. I'm glad he did, because it's a, a fantastic story. What about the 10-year-old boy? Well, the 10-year-old boy was the son of the publisher. Uh, the 10-year-old boy was called uh, Rainer Unwin. And his dad, instead of reading the book himself, said, Son, there's a children's book. I want you to read it and tell me if I should publish it. So Rainer read the book and said, Yep, Dad, I think that's a good story. Go ahead and publish it. That's how The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings came uh, into existence and became a phenomenal bestseller and became those films. Uh, and I'm not holding a grudge against my daughters. They won't sit down and watch Lord of the Rings with me. It's only about nine hours long. But uh, anyway, I'm not bitter. But I want you to imagine... Uh, one of the great, greatest stories ever told, and being able to say, maybe Reynard Unwin saying, if it hadn't been for me, that wouldn't have been published, or to say, I was part of it. Imagine being able to say, I was part of that. And then imagine the, the film, the, the actors, the extras, all of the people involved in the making of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, and being able to say, I was part of that. Now, I want you to imagine another story and the author sits, and there's not even a blank page. There is nothing, absolutely nothing. And he begins to tell his story. Light, and light bursts into being, and worlds and planets and galaxies tumble out. Time itself splashes across the page. Land surges up through what we will call seas. Birds and amazing sea creatures begin to circle the skies and in the oceans. Flowers explode in a vibrant firework display of color as he tells his story. It's the story of life, the universe, and everything being told into being. And us, creatures made like little miniatures of the Creator, little miniatures of the author of the story. That's only on page one. And as we flick through the pages of this adventure story, it's a story of time itself, it's a story of life, the universe and everything. It's a story of good and evil, a story of love and betrayal, a story of rescue and redemption, a story that has a goal, a story that is the big story, the story of what life's about. And imagine being able to say, I'm part of that story, not a walk-on part, but written into the very heart of the story itself, the heart of the storyline of everything. 
Why do I read the Bible? Do I read the Bible because I like reading old books? Do I read the Bible because I'm a Christian and I have to? Do I read the Bible because I'm a minister and I have to do it so that I can tell people something on a Sunday? Uh, no, none of those reasons. I read the Bible because the Bible is the story of life. It's what the big story of why we're here. It's where it's found. And so as we're going to be looking at Mark's gospel over tonight, tomorrow night, and Sunday night, I want us to grasp, first of all, this evening, uh, the whole point of this evening is that this is about the big story. Do you ever find yourself wondering, who am I? Why am I here? Maybe you wonder, why couldn't I be more like that other person? Why couldn't my life have been different? We all have our own story, and we all tell ourselves a story about who I am, why am I here, what am I going to do with my life, what am I going to achieve? And maybe we don't even think about it, but think about your daydreams. They're really the story you tell about yourself. If I was this and I'll be this. And maybe it's not just our daydreams, maybe it's our, our fears. And they're part of our story. What will happen if? What will happen if? And what I want us to see this weekend is that each of your lives is a story, a, a sentence. And that sentence of your life is made to fit into a bigger story, like a jigsaw piece that has to fill, uh, that, sorry, that a jigsaw piece that fits into the right story. Your life is like that jigsaw piece. And when it fits, have you ever been doing a jigsaw? And as you've looked at the jigsaw, you've seen a piece, and you're looking at the piece, and you're going, hmm, that's from a different box. That doesn't belong in this at all. There's a white bit and a straight line, and there's a splash of red, and there's a bit of green, and no. You're looking at the thousand-piece jigsaw picture, and you're going, no, no white, green, and red. It's not there. This doesn't belong. And as time goes on, you find the piece fits in, and you're amazed. It does fit, and you're really excited. You're going, yeah, this is great. Look, that's where it goes. This jigsaw piece fits here. It's part of this jigsaw. And your life is made to fit in like that, into God's big story. And that's where meaning comes from. That's where you find who you really are meant to be and why you're here. That's when you'll find out who you are and why you are the way you are. That's your life. It's that sentence that fits into the big story the big story of reality. You know, Jesus isn't just some person for Sundays. He's not just a, an historical figure. Jesus brings us right into the big story, into the story of reality. He is what it's all about. And if you remember one thing from this evening, I want it to be uh, this line. If I can find my little clicker, there we go. Christianity is the big story of reality. And Jesus brings us into the big story of life isn't the sports we play, the exam results we get, the relationships that we have or don't have, the jobs we have, whatever it is. Our friends, that's not the big story. We don't want to miss out on the big story. And I want you to see that Christianity is the big story of reality, and Jesus brings us into it. We're going to be looking at Mark, Mark's gospel, and we're going to be connecting it uh, to the big story, and we're going to dip into the beginning, the middle, and the end. But I want us to see how it always connects to the big story of the Bible and the big story of reality. And so I want us to, take, to go to the, the opening chapter this evening, and, well, before, before we read from it, there's four things I want us to see. First of all, there's the great announcement. 
the great announcement. It starts off the beginning of the good news. But you know, this is, this is part three of a four-part series. Part one of the Bible story is creation. It's the beginning. The very beginning. In the beginning, God created. It's the beginning of everything. And then we've got Genesis 3, and Genesis 3 is the beginning of the bad news. When we come to chapter 1 of Mark, what do we find in the opening line? The beginning of the good news. It's part three of the series. It's part three of this great piece of literature. It's part three of the drama of life, the universe, and everything. And part four, part four we find set out for us in the book of Revelation, where we've got a fourth beginning, the beginning of the happy ending, or in fact, we could call the beginning of happily ever after, if that's not too fairy tale like That's the Bible's storyline. It's about beginnings, and so that's why Mark starts the way it does. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. After centuries of bad news, there is this great announcement. After centuries of bad news, good news bursts onto the scene. A new section in God's drama, series three, is kicking off. Series two has been really miserable. It's been a series of failure, a series of disaster, most of the Old Testament. But all through that series, there's been little glimpses, little announcements made about what's going to happen in series three. And Mark picks up on that. You see, Mark's gospel isn't just a little thing that stands on its own. It's part of this whole drama. And whenever Mark starts it off, he starts with his echo of the very beginning from Genesis. But then he says, you remember the announcements that we had, the trailers that we had in series two. Series two, we had a guy called Isaiah. And Isaiah made predictions. He was one of many. Mark could have picked many different writers in the Old Testament who made predictions about the coming of the one who was going to bring good news. The Bible's word for him is Messiah, God's chosen one. And so Mark starts off saying, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. And as he starts to speak, He tells us about these predictions. He tells us that somebody would come to prepare the way for the rescuer. And then what happens? As we read on in Mark 1, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. What happened? John appeared, Mark says, baptizing where? In the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized in the river Jordan. The one that was predicted to come before the rescuer has arrived. It's the start of the good news. The predictions that were made, the announcements that were made in series two in the Old Testament are coming true. And that helps us to to see that the Bible, you know, isn't just sort of a a fairy tale made up. It's got these predictions that set the scene where God made His promises and kept His Word. And that gives us hope for part four, that all things will be made new because He kept His promises for part three, the coming of Jesus. All of those trailers, all of those announcements that were in the Old Testament, those promises have been kept. And so, there's this great announcement that was made by Isaiah, and a great announcement made by John. John uh, was baptizing people, and they were coming to hear his preaching, and he says, I am not the one. The one that you're waiting for, 
He is coming next. And the scene is set for centuries. God's people were waiting on the edge of their seat for the coming Savior. They long for God to come and rescue them. They have scanned the deserts for any sign of someone calling the people to get ready. And they see John. So John came. And John says, After me will come one more powerful than me. It's, it's here. Series 3 has kicked off. And people, some of them are wanting to find out what happens next. That's the drama has begun. The turning point of history is here. And then Mark tells us about the great arrival at that time. The time that Isaiah, the prophet, had been talking about. The time that John had been talking about. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. The one we've been waiting for since the start of the bad news. The serpent crusher from Genesis chapter 3, where God said, I will send one who will be a seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. He's here. He's here. The great arrival. Sometimes you may have doubts about Christianity and you wonder, is this really true? Think of those predictions that have come true. Think of the historical fact of Jesus. The hero of the story was foretold and he came. And if something happens to mark his arrival, we read in verse 10 and 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. God himself. In case anybody's going to miss the point, he says, waking up, guys, series three is kicking off. This is the beginning of the good news. Don't miss it. He says, this is my son. This is the one I've been telling you about for centuries. He's here now. Are you ready? And so, here is this, this great arrival Sometimes you might have doubts about Christianity, and you may wonder, is it really true? And not only can you look back at those predictions in the Old Testament, but you can look at this moment here and think, well, if I had been in the riverside, and I had heard a voice from heaven say, this is my son, oh, wow, that would have convinced me. So here's the big story hero that we've been waiting for. And what happens next? In Mark, the great rescue begins. Here's the big story that I'm saying that we are to be part of. The big story is that God created the world beautiful and perfect. Satan tempted the first man and the first woman to distrust God's goodness and to think that they could do a better job of writing the story themselves. So two characters in the story take the pen out of the author's hand and say, we'll write our own story, thank you very much. You ever seen that drawing by, it's an illusion by a guy called M.C. Escher, and he, it's a picture of a hand on a page, but the hand seems to grow out of the page and it's holding a pencil, and it's drawing another hand which seems to be growing out of the page and is drawing the first hand. You know, he thinks, no, well, you know, that can't happen. That's an illusion. Well, that's a bit like us trying to write the story of our lives. But that's what happened. Adam and Eve said, no thanks, God. We'll write the story ourselves. And they soon found out that Satan's lie was a terrible, or Satan had told a terrible lie, that they couldn't do a better job of writing the story. And it was a soul-destroying lie. And you and I are suffering the consequences of that lie. But God promised that a rescuer would one day come. And what does that rescuer do when he arrives, just after this moment of his baptism, remember you read when you're reading through Mark chapter 1, after the father says, this is my beloved son, with him I am well pleased, what happens? We read that the Spirit immediately drives Jesus out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. 
What is it? It's not just an interesting thing that happened in his life. It's a repeat of what happened in series two. The very start of series two, the beginning of the bad news, Satan came gunning for Adam. Now he's coming gunning for the rescuer. And will the rescuer fall like Adam did? No, he stands firm. He holds his ground. The great rescue has begun. And this is the story. We wonder why is life such a mess? Why is there brokenness in my life? Why is there hurt, pain? Why do I get discouraged? Why do people in my family get ill? Why do people I care about die? Why do I do things that I'm not happy with? It's because there is sin in the world and everything's broken. But here's the one who's come to fix it. Here he is. He's here to rid the world of sin uh, and Satan. And here's the drama. Here's the story. And as we go through on into Mark's gospel, what do we find? Jesus does miracles. Now, those miracles, they're not just Jesus walking around going, oh, you know, there's somebody there and they're blind. Oh, you know what? It'll be really nice and make them see. He was being kind, but that wasn't the main point. He didn't just wander around and go, oops, look, there's a dead person. I'll make them come alive. Oh, here, lots of hungry people. What'll I do? I think I'll feed them. That would just be sort of like accidental acts of kindness. But no, what those display is that Jesus is the creator. He is the rescuer. He is the undoer of brokenness. He is the restorer of things that are damaged. He is the fixer and the healer of pain. And he's here and he's showing I am the one who can make things new. He's the hero of the story. He has the power and the authority to put things right. He is the great rescuer, and the great rescuer is beginning. The great rescue is beginning. And that brings us to the fourth part of tonight, as we look at what happens next in Mark chapter 1. The great invitation or the great summons. Remember what comes next? Let me read it to you. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. It's here. And the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And then he's passing by the Sea of Galilee. He sees Simon and Andrew, his brother, uh, casting a net into the sea. What does he say to them? Follow me. He sees James and John. And what does he say to them? Follow me. He said, come on, this, 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 is, this is what we should be doing if. The big storyline of life is everything was made right, the, the beginning of everything. And then there's the beginning of bad news. We're waiting for the beginning of good news and the bringer of good news, the author himself, has stepped onto the page of the story, and it's, what would you expect him to say? And what would be the most intelligent thing to do if the author of it all and the fixer of it all has arrived on the page of history, you would expect him to say, come and follow me. And what would intelligent people do? Go and follow him. And that's what these disciples do. That's what Christianity is. Christianity isn't some insignificant thing that maybe your parents make you do, going to church on a Sunday. Christianity isn't uh, something that is a collection of stories that are just a bit far-fetched and hard to believe. Uh, Christianity isn't um, an add-on. You know, you've got, a, you've got your phone. That's the essential piece of kit. Uh, And then you've got your phone case. And it's pretty important, but it's not essential. It's a nice add-on. It makes your phone look pretty. It keeps it a bit safe. But it's not the main deal. It's an accessory. Christianity is not an accessory. It's the main deal. It is what life is for. Life is about knowing and enjoying the author. 
living in his story and finding that his story has a happy ending that goes on forever. Every other story that you try to write for yourself or every other story that the world would try to sell to you, whether that's a story of, if you're really successful, you'll be happy. If you go to university, then you will really have arrived. If you're in a relationship, that's what life's about. You know, if you make lots of money, if you're successful at your sport, then you are a somebody. The world tries to sell you those stories. If those stories are not part of the big story, all they are is a sentence that has died away and is gone forever. But if you and if you believe those stories and give yourself to those stories, it never makes it into the big story and a life is wasted. Everything will end in disappointment because you will find that it was all for nothing. Have you ever been reading a book or watching a film and you know, you've got a, it's a hundred pages long, it's 200 pages, it's 300 pages long, it's two hours long, and you come to the end, you think, why did I watch this? Or why did I read this? What a complete disappointment. Imagine getting to the end of life and realizing that you've lived the wrong story. You think, what a colossal disappointment. And imagine that disappointment going on forever. You know, you can have the opposite experience. You can have a life that hasn't achieved all that you wanted to achieve, that might even be looked at as a failure by people around you. But if you have connected your life, the little sentence of your life, into the big story, the big story that Jesus is writing, the big story of life, the universe, and everything, then that gives meaning and purpose to your life. Everything about your life will be written in permanent ink as opposed to written in temporary pencil. You ever finished a book or finished a film or finished a series of books or finished a, a series on Netflix and you thought, oh man, that was so good. I wish it could go on and on and on. That's what this story is about. All those stories are echoes of the big story. So, what I want to say as we finish up is Jesus says to us here, the time has come. Follow me. Repent and believe the good news. Those three words, repent. Stop trying to write your own story without God. Or writing God in as an occasional extra onto the page of your life. Oh, I need help. I'll write God in. God, come and help me now, please. <laughs> you know, you do that with God? You know, write him in as a little extra into your story? No. We need to say, I'm sorry. Forgive me for leaving you out. Forgive me for doing things my way. I want to be part of your great story. Believe the good news. Believe who Jesus is. Believe. Entrust yourself to him. Ask him to be your rescuer from your sin, your guilt, your pen-stealing I've tried to live my life my way. And trust yourself into his story and follow him. Follow him. That's the invitation. That's what he called Peter, James, and John, and Andrew to do. And that's what a Christian is. A Christian is someone who follows, who follows Jesus. And look at this. I'll, I'm going to finish with this. My brother's called Peter. My other brother's middle name is Andrew. My first name is James. We call, and I'm sure you know uh, John as well, we call our children Peter and Andrew and James and John. In the first century world, those guys were nobodies. And yet, they're the one people get called after now. Who in the first century world was a somebody? Nero was a somebody. Caesar was a somebody. 
We call our dogs after Nero and Caesar, and we call our sons after, and our daughters after, followers of Jesus. Those guys were insignificant in the first century, and they took their little story, and they put it into the big story of following Jesus. And that's where they found meaning and purpose and significance that far outlasted them. So what will you do? Which story will you be part of? On a very ordinary day by the Sea of Galilee, these men's stories changed forever. A very ordinary day by the Sea of Galilee, these people's stories changed forever. On a very ordinary night in Remelton, what will happen to your story?